Let me start that now before I forget. Okay, all right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight and our topic for our topic, meet a deaf professional. Our topic tonight is language and behavior. And our honored guest to uh, talk on that object or subject is Joshua Weinstein. So I'm gonna let Joshua introduce himself a little bit. Can you just tell me who you are and what is it that you do? Yes, hello. Currently, I'm a school psychologist at Tennessee School for the Deaf, Knoxville campus. I do collaborate with services in Nashville and Jackson campuses as well. I did just move here in October, just recently, but I'm not new to this field. I've been doing this type of work since 2005. I did start in the private sector with a private company focusing on behavioral health. I worked in that field for eight years, and then I kind of had the itch for school psychology. Um, I miss what I had trained to do. That eight years in behavioral health was a great experience, but I had the experience to work in both settings, at home and at school, in the school setting. And finally, when I was offered a job at Indiana School for the Deaf, I worked as a school psychologist for three years. Um, I had a new family and I moved east to Maryland Deaf School for four years. And then after that, we had, um, I had close family that my mother lived in North Carolina, less than three hours away. And I was ready to leave MSD, that campus. Um, there was a very strong group of deaf people and I wanted to focus on working more from children who are from hearing families and TSD has a different dem demographic. So I decided to move here and that's the short and sweet, but if you do want me to expand more, I can, but I'll let you lead this discussion. Oh yeah, that's very helpful. So we want to understand how you are and how you are a subject, uh, how you got here and how you are a subject on uh, expert on the subject. But before we start, I uh, wanted to talk about your background in deaf culture. You know, a lot of people are curious about where you're from, what's your family background, what's your school background. And I know that we have families um, here tonight that might be interested in that. Maybe you could, that might be able to apply to their child in the future. So I'm curious, your family, are you from a hearing family also, deaf family? Yes, I'm from a hearing family. I'm the only deaf person in my family. When I became deaf, I hadn't yet become three years old. And of course, at that time, the doctors told my mother that the oral method was the only way to go. And my mother really didn't buy that. Um, I did go to an oral program, or she did go to an oral program and learned about that, but um, went to a deaf school and I was able to pick up sign language. The principal met my mom for the first time and my mom delved into sign language at that time. And my younger sister, she's about 14, year, 14 months younger than me. She picked up sign language very fast as well. So the three of us signed together all the way. So my information and my way of understanding the world outside of school was through sign language. I did grow up, I was born and raised in New Jersey. I moved to North Carolina when I was nine years old. In New Jersey, I had gone to a deaf school just during the day. I didn't stay in a dorm, but once I moved to North Carolina, I was mainstreamed for a couple of years. I was in a, both a self-contained classroom and a mainstream setting. But then in sixth and seventh grade, I was fully mainstreamed with just one interpreter with 30 students, me being the only one deaf, and that was pretty difficult in that setting. In seventh grade, I realized I did not have a social life. I didn't have many friends, and my mother knew that it was time to sign. So I did go to um, a, a deaf school in North Carolina three hours away, and my mother did I did start high school there and graduated from that school. Wonderful, 
wonderful for that explanation. It's nice that you have different experience with a desk school and the mainstream situation and a self-contained classroom and being the only child mainstream. So that's wonderful that your experience in different fields, I'm sure, helps with your work now. Yes. Can you can you explain how that work, how that helps your work and how your experience impacts your work and how you uh, handle clients and, and families? Yes, often when I discuss things with families, they talk about their child and their behavior needs and um, are wondering about their friends. And many of those families that I talk to, they only sign a little bit. They, they're not very clear. And I explain that, you know, kids don't only crave to fit in with other students, but they also crave language access, full language access. And some of those families, um, when I this when I talk to them, they say, well, should I send my child to a deaf school? And I say, yes. And I explain why a deaf school is beneficial. And often after they've went to, if, if they're mainstreamed first and then go to a deaf school, they have full access to language at school. And often deaf schools tend to have a good collaboration with families, whether the families are deaf or hearing, they have more contacts and support and resources for families. Maybe they'll explain a program or a company that has um, better staff that know how to sign and already know those areas. Right now, my counseling team is working on um, Chattanooga mental health providers and contacting any who sign, as well as in Nashville, Clarksville, Jackson, Memphis, we're contacting people and we're becoming sort of the center for the deaf here in Tennessee for those services. That's wonderful. Thank you for expanding on that. So now on the topic of behavior, you had mentioned just a little bit how your family would, you know, the families come to you and ask you, why is my child behaving this way? But before we dive into behavior, I'd like to start off with why language is important and how language impacts behavior, because I feel like those are two separate issues. Um, like language is how someone communicates and behavior is how someone responds to thing, things. So how do those um, connect? Can you elaborate on that? That's a good question. When I was in graduate school, um, one guy I read about, his name was Noam Chomsky. And he had explained that language and cognition are interconnected. There's, you can't separate them. They're intertwined. Um, it's not like they overlap a little bit. They, they completely over, overlap. So pretty much our brain development is based on language. And the more delayed language is, the more delayed brain development is. And the social part increases through your life with uh, language. So the brain has its own limitations. And if language is um, oppressed or you, if kids don't have a lot of, uh, if they've been deprived of language, then they don't have a lot of patience and more things in development become behind. You know, when you think of animals, you have like a kingdom and then different groups of animals. So in that same kind of thing, the more language a child gets, they're able to categorize. And, you know, deaf or hearing, a lot of children see something with four legs and have a tail, they categorize that as a dog. And maybe they'll see a horse and say, that's a dog. And we're like, yes, that has four legs, but really that's a horse. And the kid has categorized, oh, so that's a horse. Um, so that access to language, when we follow the, the, the child's lead, lead in asking for things and take turns in communicating, kids that don't have a lot of language end up not having a good connection with people and connection with families 
connection in many ways are limited, but when they have that conversation and language, you have more of a rich connection. It's kind of like a tree that sprouts out its roots. You can connect about shared interests. You can connect about a movie or food or, you know, any kind of activities. All of those things, all of those connections happen through language. When you sit down with kids and you read a book and you go back and forth and the kid points at something and says, yeah, I saw that yesterday. And you say, where did you see that yesterday? Oh, I saw that while I was driving. Oh, I missed that. You had a good eye. So the kid realizes, oh, I understand that I saw something that you didn't see because you were driving. And that kind of turn-taking communication builds those connections and maybe they might say you remember a month or two ago I, I saw that at the zoo and you can say oh you did remember that and that kind of praise and connection is based on prior experiences and that deep meaningful communication that does set a lot of cognition and cognitive development and children are more able to think about exactly how they learn and are able to divide that type of knowledge into groups. So that concept not only applies to deaf children, but it applies to all children. Uh, it's the key to developing language or the key to developing language is by communication and having that connection and that engagement. So in that theory, uh, communication methods, you know, some people choose to be more oral, some people choose to be uh, more ASL, but the concept still applies to either way. It's connection and interaction. Would you agree with that? Or can you maybe expand a little more on that? Connection is pretty much the bottom line. It is the foundation. When a person is skilled in language. Well, if I go back, not just in a deaf experience, if a hearing child and a deaf and hearing parents, you know, they're, they, they just want to absorb knowledge. So if the child says something a little weird with a long E when it should be a short E and maybe the parent will say, oh, you mean this word and they say it correctly and the child picks it up. In a deaf for a deaf child where the family is not skilled in sign language and the child points at something and tries to describe it, the parents don't just give them the ASL. They kind of feel like, how can I do this communication and interaction? They might feel guilty about that. So the deaf child really needs a person skilled in the language. And I do feel for a lot of medical professionals their training is to fix someone. So when a child is deaf, they say, oh, when, when they're born, I need to fix them by, they need a cochlear implant. That way they can develop speech. But the problem is you're holding off that um, development and all of those opportunities you've missed along the way. So you should have that constant language stimulation, sign language, if you want the cochlear implant, that's okay. But while you're waiting, go ahead and use the sign language and go ahead and start that language connection and turn-taking communication. And that's a beautiful experience. So you brought up a really good point. I know this is something that a lot of our parents uh, really struggle with, you know, feeling that guilt of, I want to sign and provide all the language access to my child, but I'm not fluent yet. I'm still learning myself. So should they give up or stop? Or, I mean, I'm sure that a lot of parents feel very overwhelmed with that process, but how can they stay positive and keep going and know that what they're doing now is still making an impact? I do think that's tough. I look at my mom as one example. She was hearing, yes, but I look at other families through my studies and friends who are from hearing families. And I did notice that most moms didn't work. They stayed home and same as my mom. And my mom was very involved in the PTA, Parent Teacher Association at school. She was very involved in events and activities. 
and so forth. So my mom became, you know, president of that. So I'm not saying you have to become president of the PTA, but you need to be involved in activities, volunteer at the school, go ahead and, you know, my mom, she set up Boy Scouts at my school in New Jersey. I remember that. She went ahead and took that responsibility over. So that was her opportunity to get in there with other students. And a lot of times I see in hearing families that I've met, they try to kind of read my signing, but they're used to their own child signs. While deaf professionals and hearing professionals who sign, they're used to reading different student signs and those who are more involved in their school, in their child's school and deaf groups, meeting other deaf children, they become more comfortable and more fluent in the language. And they realize, oh, that's the sign for that. Remember when you signed, when my child signed that to me, I never understood that. So, you know, volunteer as a classroom aid and maybe get involved in some after school activities or events. That's a great opportunity right there. Yeah, and not just a wonderful opportunity to get involved and learn the language, but you connect with your child, too, during that process. Like you mentioned, Boy Scouts, I can imagine there's a lot of fond memories with you and your mom during then, and it wasn't just about the language, but that bond and that intimacy with your family. So I think that's wonderful and beautiful. Yeah, uh, I, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, um, so moving on to behavior. Well, I, I'm, I'm thinking of some families that I work with that have like children that are about age two. Uh, some behaviors could be related because they're two years old, you know. Yeah. And it's just, a, you know, the terrible twos, you know, they're all grouchy or whatever. But how can you identify if that's just a normal toddler behavior or if it's a bad behavior because the child doesn't understand or isn't able to communicate? Um, what's the difference? Or if you can't identify the difference, what are some strategies to maybe figure out and figure out how that works or what's going on? Yes, that's a great question. You brought up two variables, you know, two possibilities here. Um, is the behavior because they're two years old or because of a lack of communication? The easy answer is don't let that miscommunication be an option. Don't let that become a variable. Don't let that be a constant question to yourself. Am I signing this correctly? Am I miscommunicating? Um, is it because they don't understand me? You know, if you have a good connection and you have good communication and interactions, you don't have to worry about that. So don't let that become a possible variable. So that's one focus. But another way is I assume that it's possible, you know, some of you are, are learning sign language. So to answer that question for those of you who are not fluent and are still questioning that, just be consistent consistency is key. Suppose you're playing, you're at the playground and you say, it's time to go. And they say, no, I want to stay. And, you know, suppose you go to the playground and you say, you have one minute. And once time is up, you say, one minute is finished. Come on. And the kid says, no, no, no. And you say, oh, okay, it's fine, stay longer. But then another time you say, no, it's time to go. And the kid now gets confused. Before you said one minute, and then if I cried before, you would let me stay, but now you won't let me stay. And sometimes the answer is yes, and sometimes the answer is no. And that can increase frustration in that situation. So my suggestion is anytime you tell a child, you have one more minute, 95% of the time, you should... Tell them to come yeah, on, yeah. and if they refused, go ahead and take them and put them in the car and buckle them up. I know sometimes you feel like you can't, but it's easier to do that now when they're small than when they're bigger and they can argue about it. Having that early connection and compliance is better in that minute. And, you know, you might say you have one minute, 
And if they refuse, you'll say, I'm gonna give you two options. First option is to hold my hand and walk with me to the car. Or the second option is I'm going to pick you up and take you to the car. Which of those options would you like? And then you say, you know, uh, I also say don't count up, count down. Please don't use fractions. Don't say one and a half or one and a quarter. Just say three, one, two, two one. one. And, you know, the, if the kid goes ahead and walks to the car with you, that's great. But just again, consistency is key. Some of you may prefer a five minute warning and then a one minute warning and that's fine. You know, tell them at five minutes and then at the one minute mark, let them know and then say time's up, it's time to go. And if the kid refuses, I'm telling you now at the ages from one to three, it's easy to pick them up and put them in the car. But any older than that, it's not going to be pretty. <laughs> it's screaming and yelling and carrying them, yeah. Well, I really like that point about consistency. And I agree that that applies to really not just children's behavior, but really in general for anything. If you want positive behaviors to happen, you have to be consistent. Uh, like with exercising or dieting or whatever, if you want good results, you have to have consistency. So I think that, yeah, also applies to behavior. And the same with a paycheck. Everyone gets paid right on time. Yeah. You go to work on time. You stay until time is over. It's the same concept. Yes, absolutely. So now I think is a good time to switch over to the question and answer session. Um, so I want to remind our audience that some of you, uh, we know some of you are new, but we want to have families uh, have the opportunity to ask questions first. And after the families are finished, then we can let the community members or professionals ask some questions. So families, if you have any questions, um, you can open up your screen and voice that. The interpreters will interpret for you if you need, or you can type that, uh, your question in the chat. Now, if you um, do open your screen, just make sure you give me just a, a moment to spotlight you on the screen, okay? So come on, the floor is open. Send in your questions. And again, you know, the questions can be about anything, anything related to language or behavior or to Josh or his experience. I mean, take advantage of his knowledge and his, his you know, in-depth experience with this field. Okay. Amy, go right ahead. Hello. Hi, nice to meet you. I always was curious about the topic of the dinner table syndrome. My family signs, my parents are slowly learning how to sign. Um, they try hard, but in gatherings, or big groups, it's hard. Um, do you have advice for that situation? Yeah, that's a great question. I myself have had experience with that. Most of the time, actually, I was fortunate. My uh, dinner table, breakfast and lunch also, my mother and my sister, my dad was not a great signer, I admit. Most fathers that I know in general um, just sign just a little bit. They really rely on the mother. But again, it's really, it could just be the entire family talking about two moms or two dads, you know, or single mom or single dad, uh, grandparents that take care of children. It can be tough. But when I was growing up, my mom and my sister did make the effort to sign when you know whenever they were talking and oftentimes they interpreted for my father um they were pretty good but like when we're like on holidays you know and a lot of parent family come in they would sign a little bit I had an aunt that signed pretty well but most of my you know cousins uncles and them they didn't really sign and that was really tough you know for them to kind of interpret for me all the time so I encourage, especially when the kids are very young, 
uh, maybe a couple of years, one, two or three years old, try to use, you know, whose turn it is to talk. For example, a fake apple. Do you want to talk? Then you get to hold the apple, right? So that way the deaf kid sees the apple or the object. It doesn't have to be an apple. It can be, you know, a doll or any anything. Um, so whoever has that object, that person signs directly, you know, to the mom or mom signing to another mom or something like that. And then when the other person responds to answer the question, hand them the object or the apple, for example. And then you point that out to the deaf child and the deaf child maybe give the deaf child the apple and they might throw it. But, you know, the concept is to pass the object around to train who is holding the object it is their turn to make a comment. And that would help the, help the child direct uh, their attention. And that also helps the other people pa pay attention, you know, brothers, sisters, you know, family members. Does that answer your question some? Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you for that great answer. I do see a comment from Amy that says, I love that idea. Thank you, train the whole family. Okay, any other questions? Bring them on from parents or family members? Um, I actually have a question. If there's none. Okay, um, me and my husband, we are new at this. Our daughter is going to be three months old on June the 4th. And we were wondering, she had just been diagnosed after birth with being se having severe hearing loss. And we were getting ready to learn sign language in case she needed it in the future. Now, her left ear is the only one that has the severe hearing loss. She can hear fine out of her right ear. What is the best way that we can retain learning sign language and at what age should we try to teach her? You said your daughter is three months old? Yeah, she'll be going on three months old on the fourth. Oh, so sweet. That's such a fun time. It's a fun age. I think that's a great opportunity, especially for feeding time when I don't know at, at three months, but soon you'll be able to sit down, um, open up um, some food and say, here's an apple, apple and feed them the, the baby food of an apple and just make the sound, maybe do the airplane zoom into the mouth or um, a train blowing and you can you can do the signs and the sounds and make it a fun experience for the kid to see the sign for train or you can use a toy nearby or a book that has a train in it and describe it through sign language and sounds and just make that a fun opportunity with connecting language with food and right now at three months old I can't remember exactly I think my daughter started on soft foods maybe six months, but just, you can still say milk, you know, sign milk, make that connection, whether it's formula or breastfed, you can talk about, do you want milk or hold up a book and point to, you know, milk comes from a cow and a cow says what? It says moo and the kid might laugh a little bit and it makes, you know, that connection between feeding and the language opportunity. Also, I wanted to comment, you were talking about when should we start teaching uh, your daughter's sign language? Really, you can start now. You can start at any time. Um, like, they, like he said, you don't have to start learning everything all at once, but it, like you know, Josh had mentioned, you just start small, like with some food signs, facial expressions, and increase that, increase their visual communication. For example, eye contact when you're holding your baby and looking at your baby. Make sure that you're looking at her, not just her face when you communicate, but also when you're um, signing or 
talking so that you can develop that bond so that she knows she needs to use her eyes to look around and use her hands to communicate them. So really, um, you could start doing that now. There's no reason to wait. Thank you for that question. That was really, that was good. Okay. I see um, another comment in the chat box. Yeah, from Keisha, I think. Keisha, I will sign her question. Uh, she said she is now a foster parent of a 20 month old or 20 month old twin boys that have moderate hearing loss. Both boys wear hearing aids when they're not pulling them off, of course. Um, they are now uh, in verbal therapy, audio verbal therapy, AVT, but also learning sign language. But the AV, it's not, they don't encourage the sign language, the AVT. And they said, if anyone starts to sign, what? What? Um, um, make sure I'm reading this right. Yeah, that, so basically, um, the AV therapist said that, um, is there anyone in there? Hang on, hang on one second. Hold okay. on one second. Okay, I just wanted to highlight the interpreter. So if you don't mind repeating yourself. Sure. So uh, the twins are 20 months old, and they go to AV therapy. And of course, AV doesn't really encourage learning sign language as part of that method. Uh, they said that uh, basically, is there anyone in their life is anyone in their life doing sign language with them, whether at daycare, if they go back to their family, is anyone signing? And so what would be the point of learning sign language? But I was thinking that it might be good just in case they do need it. And I'm, so I was wondering if you ever encountered that, that situation. Yes, yes. I, I would love to answer that question. And I'm very glad that you brought it up. I know there are professions out there or specific fields that are maybe more strongly um, rigid in their thinking, more of that in the box thinking. But the problem is, I agree with you, you're right. What if is the question. However, if you look at the research, neurodevelopment research, shows that regardless of one or two languages, there is no evidence of con confusing those languages. AV therapy, if you take them, it may still be good for development for hearing and speech. I encourage you to still go to that, but their comment that they say signing is confusing, they're wrong, they're wrong, period. I encourage you to expose them to language, sign language, verbal communication. I, I encourage both of those. On the inside, that child will be able to switch modes. Maybe one child is more visual and f rely more on sign language, while the other one may be more reliant on their hearing and speech. But I think it's best to give them the best of both worlds. And suppose they both go to a deaf school and maybe one of them feels like they fit in there, but the other one feels like they would rather be mainstreamed or rather go in between both a mainstream school and a deaf school. So I think it's important to develop both of those language. And I do encourage you, when you do sign with them, turn your voice off when you sign. You know, you can sign, if you're signing cow and speaking cow, maybe sign cow and then say moo. Or maybe another time, just say cow and don't sign. And you say, yes, a cow makes milk and says moo. And you say that, but try to separate those two languages. Focus on sign language as its own language without using your voice. And if there's other opportunities to talk, go ahead and do that. But if you're talking, you might say, do you remember I taught you this sign this morning? And you're speaking this. You say, you remember I taught you this sign this morning? What was that? And the child signs cow. So they're able to switch between the verbal and the sign language. So I say, yes, go ahead and sign. Yes, and also I wanted to add that it's really also important to keep in mind that ASL and English are both complete languages in their own right. So like looking at the bilingual schools, like Spanish and English, for example, 
a lot of children learn Spanish and English at the same time when they're just from birth, you know, and they learn that and they're able to switch back and forth between the languages and that's fine. And the same situation, uh, the same thing applies to this situation. The only difference is, is that ASL is a visual language. It is not a spoken language. So that's why a lot of people get uh, confused on that. You know, they feel like, oh, that's a conflict, you know, signing and speaking. But you're right. Studies have shown that the brain is able to show, can uh, split the difference um, and have their own pathways to different languages. So absolutely, there is absolutely no reason to stop one or the other, just do them both at the same time. That's wonderful. Okay, are there any more questions or comments? I saw someone had their hand raised a moment ago. Danielle? Hi, go ahead, Danielle. Yes, I had a question related to educational interpreting specifically. Several educational interpreters have joined this meeting today and I'm, I am happy about that. And you do know that we do know that in mainstream situations, typically people are not knowledgeable about deaf education and the interpreter is a little more aware and is able to catch behavior that um, maybe the other people in the field don't see. So who do we go up to? You know, those professionals, that team isn't knowledgeable about deaf education and where does the interpreter fit in? What's your recommendation on how the interpreter can handle that? Yes, that that's is a, a good question. question. That's not a good question, it's a great question. I'm sure I've seen that issue many times. It's not rare. Um, Honestly, it's tough, especially if the child is alone and other professionals don't know anything about deaf culture or deaf education, especially deaf education, because in the field of instruction, you have a deaf child there at the school and they don't know what to do with this deaf child. You know, the interpreter will know best, but the problem is they don't realize the interpreter's role is to facilitate communication, not to discipline, not to take over, not to uh, you know, behavior correct or whatever. So that's an issue. So I encourage educational interpreters if they see that happen over and over and uh, other employees at school, you know, maybe I would encourage them, why don't you connect with the School for the Deaf, um, connect with their outreach program and talk to them. And then the outreach program from TSD Tennessee School from the Deaf can collaborate with the deaf school. No, I'm sorry, can collaborate with the public schools um, and the students there and how to approach the behavior and what to think about and provide training. Um, maybe do a little bit of a case study with the student, you know, and then explain what needs to happen to connect with deaf families and how to respond to specific behaviors so that it's not, an, not a burden on the educational interpreter. Um, not only is that a concern, the burden on the educational interpreter, but in my studies on behavior, when behavior is not correct behavior, we give feedback to try to lessen that behavior, to treat the behavior. If we don't know, and we just sort of like poo-poo it, leave it alone, that behavior starts to manifest, right? And it just gets worse and worse and spirals out of control. And then when that child gets older, it becomes more of a challenge to fix that, to go back in and fix that, that behavior. So I strongly encourage educational interpreters to, you know, go to their professionals at the school at first. And if not, you know, get to somebody and have them please contact the outreach program at TSD. That might be a good starting point. Um, if not, you can always contact me and we can try to figure out other creative ways to do things. It also depends on the state. The state has an outreach program, then, you know, Tennessee does, but a lot of states should have that. Um, I think that's a, a good starting place. Great. Thank you. Thank yes, you, Danielle. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, Heidi. Okay. There is one comment in the chat box, um, two actually, two comments. 
One comment is from Ashley. She says she is an AESL teacher and she says, yes, she agrees that she's right about the Spanish and English development. So it's really the same with ASL and English development. Great, thank you for that um, agreement, Ashley. And then the next one is uh, Christina had said, related to that answer about taking, turning your voice off when signing, her, her daughter refuses to look at her when she signs. So she's asking, how can I make sure my daughter's looking at me when I'm signing? Do I go out? Because I, when I go in front of her, she looks away. I feel like I have to voice uh, to get my point across with my signs. Um, and I'm curious, how old is your daughter? Um, I'm trying to figure out my answer based on age. Christina, could you expand on that? Yes, she's four, almost five. Hang on one second. Yeah. Okay. I do think it's difficult. Some kids, you know, there are many things at play. Maybe they really cherish that connection through speaking, or it could be that they feel like it's a different language and they feel a little awkward with it. And some kids, you know, automatically are visual language learners and some it takes a while. However, assuming that any of those are not variables, one of the great things to think about or a great opportunity would be to get on the floor and play with her and maybe take a doll and say, look at the doll and show a look of surprise when they look at you and, you know, oh yeah, see the doll. And then they look at you and give a look of surprise. And, you know, I'm biased. I maybe shouldn't have said doll. I should have said any toy, put any toy in front of them. If she likes cars, that's fine. Take a toy car and put it to the face and let her follow that thing of interest. Same with food. I think if you try to be silly with things and you play more and you try to draw attention that way and laugh, it might she might feel more motivated to have that eye contact continue while you're signing. But if this does continue to be an issue, feel free, feel free to contact me. Um, I'm still working through the month of June. I am available to talk more in depth if we need more strategies, if this isn't an automatic solution. Thank you. Yes. All right, thank you. Wonderful ideas and strategies, great. Are there any other comments or questions? We are approaching the end of our time. We have maybe about 10 minutes left. So if you have any thoughts or any questions, please go ahead and um, go ahead and throw those out. And, and once again, these questions are open to anybody, family, community, um, Sharon a, says, how, how important are facial expressions in, in the deaf community doing that very early? How, do, how about that? That is a wonderful question. That is one of my favorite topics, honestly, related to language. Some of the adjectives, adverbs shown on the face. Like when you say no, you have that flat look on your face. That's a final answer or no. You know, I'm upset with what you did. No, those little changes in the facial expressions convey very different feelings behind words. Or for example, you know, you say hot and you have this face or you say it's hot. So those differences in facial expressions, you know, you can have a written English that says it is hot or it is so hot. I can't stand it. And that's, you would sign that like, like this, it's hot. And you would have that facial expression and mouth movement and your eyebrows would change. And, you know, it's so hot. I'm thirsty. I'm sweaty. And that facial expression shows more emphasis for those children. 
and it also is more of a conversational type of interaction when you say oh wow it's so hot I can't go outside I feel like I could just lay down and that's you're explaining more of you're so hot you shouldn't be outside you know it's more of a formal language level of language you're adding a fact but you're still using facial expressions and conveying the point with the topic you may say i'm drinking a lot of water and that facial expression you're drinking it because you're hot that information shows through your facial expressions thank you great it is hot today yes it is it is hot outside summer is here for sure oh yes but thank god for saturday temperatures are finally going to be going down and yes. we're gonna rest and cool off Yes, and I'm sure that a lot of uh, people in the audience today have seen our adverbs being hot and everything. I just love that topic, too. Um, I have another comment in the chat box. It says, what are some strategies for creating language-rich environments? Um, yes, learning ASL is one thing, but are there other strategies to make sure that child is exposed to language stay at home? I think language rich environment is up for a very broad interpretation when we talk about bilingual well if we're talking about bilingual or just one language the general concept of language rich means that if there's you know not a lot of things that show language you know adults or other people signing and showing that language to the child maybe i'm a single father and you know, there's no siblings involved. It's not language rich. I may try to introduce DVDs or movies that have a deaf person signing a story in them and maybe sign stories back and forth. There are some ASL videos that are made by deaf crews, deaf people. Um, that may be a good opportunity to expose them to a language rich environment. And currently my daughter is hearing but often when we watch movies, sometimes I'll pause the movie and have a discussion and expand on the movie because sometimes they may um, have an idiom or something that I know that my daughter doesn't understand. So I take a moment and pause and sign and explain it. Even though she's hearing, I still want to provide that language rich environment. You know, the movie's purpose is not to expound on that idiom, but it's more for enjoyment. So it can be more entertainment between me and my daughter to connect with the movie as well. And I want to provide that language rich environment at the same time, but at the dinner table, we sign together and talk, talk about food, what's happened in her day and just keep that language flowing in the home. And for hearing people, a language rich environment in English means just talking a lot. But if we're talking about bilingual, labeling things in the house. Um, that's a good way for kids to understand what exactly things are. You know, if there's a chair, you can say chair, desk chair, rolling chair, chair with wheels. Don't be afraid to expand. Even if the kids are young, they'll pick up on those categories themselves. Yes. Thank you. Okay, another comment. There are two comments in the chat there. I want to get an opportunity to, get to answer these. And I think these will be our last questions for the night. But for Miranda, she said she is an educational interpreter in a public school setting and her student is hard of hearing, has a hearing aid, doesn't always look at me, but um, will soon um, enter first grade. But the child development is not at grade level. So I, as the interpreter, should I encourage the child to look at me more often? Um, it seems the only time the child looks at me is when the child doesn't understand something. So do you feel the child uh, needs to, I should prompt the child to look at me more often or what should the interpreter do? Yes, that's a great question. We have a lot of great questions tonight. Yes. 
I do remember my experience growing up mainstreams, even though I wasn't mainstreamed when I was at that age in first grade, I did find myself watching the interpreter and my eyes would get tired and I'd have to look away. And hearing students, when they're sitting in a classroom and the teacher's talking, they can look around at other things while they're um, during the lecture. So their eyes are constantly looking at different distances, lights, colors. And while the deaf student has to continue to look at the interpreter the whole time, it gets hard. And the kid as soon as in, as soon as in first grade. So for the attention span, it's hard to expect that child to watch the interpreter. I'm sure other children are look, moving around and looking in their seats and still listening to the teacher. So maybe I would suggest moving in their focus, um, not just um, having them look in one place. So if the student's sitting in one place, then I may, you know, move in like a W position, like my last name, move to like the right the middle and the left. You don't have to be obvious about it. You can be subtle, but just take a couple steps while you're signing, a couple steps forward, a couple steps back in kind of a W-shaped direction. And that may, you know, it may be a little more slow movement, but I do think it would be important to start showing a look of surprise. Like if somebody's looking, instead of just saying, hey, look, hey, look, um, that child maybe kind of get sick of it or maybe feel embarrassed. Maybe they think I stand, you know, I stand out and I'm embarrassed. I've got an adult with me. You know, a lot of kids pick up on that at an early age. So I think it's important to make that a fun experience for them. School's hard enough. It's some things are easy. Some things are hard in that environment. So just trying to make that whole process of connecting to an interpreter fun and I do think when there is downtime, go ahead and have side conversations and say, hey, I like your shoes. Um, did you pick out your clothes or who, get, who gave those to you? And maybe they'd be excited to have that kind of question answer connection and maybe they'll be more motivated to pay attention to. Okay, so another comment from Christy says, yeah, because a lot of people view ASL as a visual language, not they don't consider it a true language. So when that perspective starts to change, do you think that more people will look at ASL as beneficial for a bilingual uh, experience and be more accept acceptable to people who don't encourage ASL? Yes, um, you did bring up a good point there. There are some perspectives out there um, people just don't know. And honestly, for myself, looking back, I wish that my educational journey had been a little different. For a long time, even when I was a student at Gallaudet, until I was a senior, um, my fourth year at Gallaudet University, um, ASL rules, concepts, viewing ASL as its own language had not been clearly explained until I luckily took an intro to ASL structure course. And that teacher, Seal Lucas, wrote his own textbook. And he was hearing, um, he retired long ago, but he was, it was amazing. For a long time, other people had said that ASL was quote unquote broken English. And I didn't know how to explain it any other way, but it, it wasn't. Once I took that class, I thought I should have taken this my freshman year. I wish I took a course like this in high school. My high school didn't offer that, explaining exactly what ASL was. And some people would say, is ASL universal? And I would say, no, it's not. And there's a lot of misconceptions about ASL. But my biggest thing that I emphasize should be seeking an ASL class, taking one through a deaf person, taking one who's taught by a deaf person. I think a lot of people who are hearing probably mean well in taking a deaf person's platform 
you know, providing a class, but they're not fluent in ASL and their ability to follow curriculum for teaching ASL, they don't. But a deaf professional tends to go to school and takes training on how to teach ASL and they can go through and teach the structure of ASL to the hearing person. So hearing people should seek out deaf professionals who are fluent in ASL. Maybe hearing people will say, um, you know, I know that, oh, you're hearing, I'm hearing, you're going to teach me sign language, we can talk together, it's more comfortable. But then once it's time to turn off our voices for the ASL class, you can do that and then you talk afterward. Well, you do know that deaf people growing up, we're not in a, when we're not in our comfort zone growing up. We've got to move out of our comfort zone to educate, to explain, to show people how. Sometimes people ask us questions that are very repetitive and we're not in the mood to answer that type of question, but you still have to explain it. And I do think it's very important to show if you want to become fluent in sign language, understand the culture, seek out a deaf person. And the same concept with a lot of BLM movement going on, we do need to give black people their platform to explain to us and keep our minds open and learn. We can't just learn through a white person. It doesn't feel right. So that concept applies with have, seeking out a deaf person and learn from them, follow their platform. And not only in your experience, having a good experience for you as a student, but giving them the experience to grow in their craft. It's not just seeking out a deaf person to learn ASL from, but in general, like for example, deaf behaviors, you know, why do they behave that way? You know, that's why we, you know, have a deaf psychologist um, wanting to know more about their education talk to a deaf teacher, you know, that kind of thing. There are so many deaf professionals out there who are very qualified and very knowledgeable with their content. So take advantage of that opportunity to talk to people who have already lived the experience that your child may possibly have in the future. And it's funny, I do have a brief story related to that with ASL learning. I do remember a while ago, there were deaf professionals that were frustrated that hearing people weren't coming up to them. And honestly, I didn't know what to tell them. Um, I tried to stay neutral most of the time until I provided a workshop and I presented about mental health um, for deaf. Um, if they're in crisis, what do you do? I had a good PowerPoint, I presented. And those in the audience, I looked around and I think there were about 100 people in the audience and maybe three to five of them came up to me. Another 10 or 15 went and talked to the interpreters. And I just felt a little like disappointed. I was like, I'm the professional here. Um, so often I'll go to workshops where the hearing presenter is finished. There are a line of people ready to talk to that professional. There's no other person to talk to. But if I present, only a few come to me and a bunch go to the interpreter. And that it requires me to not feel comfortable. I have to say, come to me, you know, see how I've answered your questions tonight. I don't bite. I just say, oh, that's a good question. And we have our conversation. You know, deaf people are always motivated to educate and work with you. Yes. Well, I think that's wonderful, a wonderful way to wrap up the evening. Um, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. I learned a lot from you and I know that our audience really did too. Um, thank you so much for your wealth of knowledge and your experience. And I'm sure that our audience, you know, if any of you have any more questions or any thoughts that come up later, please contact me and I can connect you to the right pe person to talk to, or I can connect you with Josh too, if it's appropriate. Okay. So a lot of people are commenting. Thank you. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. So you guys can 